Well, we should uh, get started. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning, and welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, I'm Gary Schmidt. I'm a resident scholar here at AEI, uh, do, working on strategic studies. Uh, today's event is a conversation with Congressman uh, Michael McCall on the many geopolitical challenges facing the U.S. today. Uh, I was just thinking about listing those. You know, when you sort of you got Russia, you got China, you got Iran, you got North Korea, you have ongoing conflicts in uh, at Afghanistan still in Syria. Uh, the Washington Post reports today that ISIS is making a comeback in, in, uh, in Iraq. We have cyber issues. Uh, it's a lot. It's, an impre it's, 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 you know, my 30 plus years here in town, I don't think I've ever seen uh, an environment that is as complex and daunting as the one uh, we face today. But that's a great reason for you being here. And we want to thank you. Uh, 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 Congressman McCall is the chairman of the House uh, Homeland Security Committee and also a senior member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, you have his bio, those of you who are here, but for those watching over the internet, let me do a brief introdu introduction. Uh, Congressman McCall uh, represents the 10th District in Texas, uh, which st stretches from northwest of Austin all the way to the uh, outskirts of uh, Houston. Um, he was elected in uh, 2004, so this is his seventh term uh, in, in the House. Uh, he has been the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee since uh, 2013, and again, is a s senior member on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Before coming to Washington, uh, uh, the congressman worked uh, in the Department of Justice for a decade. He was uh, a lawyer, trained lawyer, and um, in the West, Tex West Texas District uh, for the U.S. Attorney's Office, headed up the counterterrorism uh, effort there and also was the Deputy Attorney General in the state of Texas <coughs> when uh, now Senator John Cornyn was the Texas State Attorney General. Uh, I also I meant to bring, but I also want to point out that he's the author of a, a very fine book called Failures of Imagination, The Deadliest Threats to Our Homeland and How to Thwart Them. Congressman, it's a great pleasure to have a fellow Texan here at AEI. Thanks, thanks We don't have enough of them here. No, thanks so. for having me. Um, let me begin with... Uh, with a question which is kind of uh, in the news and, and the elephant in the room. Um, President Trump's uh, press conference after his meeting with uh, President Putin, uh, uh, in, that, in that meeting he seemed to su suggest, uh, or strongly suggested, uh, he had very serious doubts about the Russian interference in the American election. Uh, he's obviously, he walked that back a bit yesterday. Um, but since your position on the Homeland Security Committee and then Foreign Relations Committee, I just want to get your uh, comments on mm -hmm. the fact of the case, not, less, not so much what the president said, but the actual fact of, of whether or not the Russian, from your point of view, the Russians did interfere in the election. Right, and I think the president's words are uh, very important as well. I, I, I got briefed uh, <clears throat> on this threat in October of 2016, uh, what's called a Gang of Eight briefing, a uh, classified briefing by... Uh, then Secretary Jay Johnson and the DNI uh, uh, Clapper. Uh, it was uh, uh, real. Uh, the attribution went back to um, both the FSB and their intelligence bureau in the Kremlin. Uh, and I was very disturbed at that time. And I called upon the current administration at that time uh, to s call out Russia for what they were doing and condemn it. Uh, I also had an opportunity um, uh, sort of, uh, I don't know, sort of oddly, I, I was pulled in to help uh, prep mm -hmm. the candidate Trump, and I raised it at that point in time that it was going to come up. Uh, and again, th this happened, and it should be uh, condemned, and um, it's a, a front of our democracy. Uh, I've been sort of astounded at the, the inability, you know, whether it was the previous administration or now this president, to call it for what it was, uh, and condemn it. You know, Congress passed sanctions to sanction Russia for their overt aggression in Crimea and Ukraine and the Baltic states, but also their uh, affront on our democracy and meddling in our elections. I find it completely unacceptable. Whether you're a Republican or Democrat, this is completely unacceptable. And uh, I don't understand the reluctance uh, when he almost sided with Putin over our intelligence community assessment. Mm -hmm. 
that I think uh, is demoralizing to our intelligence community. Um, and quite frankly, um, I know there's a retraction yesterday where he sort of stood back from that yeah. uh, that comment. Um, I don't know if that was uh, him trying to get close to Putin in some way to, to work things out. We have a lot of joint problems together. It would be Syria, uh, Crimea, uh, the elections. Uh, I fully believe, I had a hearing on this uh, last week, that they're going to they're gonna do the same thing in our 2016 midterm elections. Well, that's what I was going to ask you is how, given what's happened, What's your impression of how well prepared we are moving forward? I think I think we are. <clears throat> we uh, we we uh, appropriated a lot of money for this. Uh, I met with the the head of uh, the cyber agency, for lack of a better word, at DHS, and they're tasked with ensuring that uh, our voting machines are are not uh, that they're not vulnerable mm -hmm. and they're resilient. The only thing that I worry about is the campaign disinformation warfare that they're so good at. This is what they did in the 2016 election was to sow the seeds of discord and chaos into our election. I saw them do this in France when Macron was, I was actually there the day of the election and they were doing the same thing in France, but the French people bought, they didn't buy off on it. Mm -hmm. They knew it was the Russians that, that were doing this. So <clears throat> I have no doubt they're going to try to do it again. And also uh, under good, uh, intelligence think they're targeting uh, specific members of Congress. And so uh, I, I just, you know, it's an affront on our democracy and it cannot stand. Um, and I don't want to make this conversation because I really do want to talk about your, your views about foreign policy and national security. Um, uh, so I don't want to make this a conversation about President Trump, but I, I do want to sort of raise, uh, so when I was in the White House, we used to have, a, I mean, this common saying, which is there's nothing more aggravating uh, than dealing with your allies, except when you don't have allies. Um, <laughs> and one has the impression that the, that the president's approach to our allies is obviously much more negative um, and seemingly with somebody like <coughs> President Putin, somewhat benign. Um, mm. Is there a logic to this? Is there something, or is this something, you know, you think there's a better way of going about this? Yeah. Well, my biggest criticism of the Obama administration was our allies no longer trusted us and our enemies no longer feared us. And I think that's an important principle. If you look at <clears throat> historically Churchill dealing with Hitler and appeasement with Chamberlain to Reagan, peace through strength, and how he dealt with uh, uh, the communists in, in the Soviet Union. And I always think historically that that needs to be projected. NATO was a creature of uh, the Cold War and, uh, and our ability to work with our European allies against what we consider to be the greatest threat, and that was Russia, the Soviet Union. Um, as he went through NATO, I, I think he shook it up a little bit. And I, I, I will say this, one positive that I'll give them credit for is for years we've tried to get the NATO allies to pay their share of the burden, and that is 2% of the GDP. Um, we pay about 4% of our GDP to the military, and they have, they have yet to step up to the plate. And I think what the president was trying to do is get them to finally step up to the plate to create a stronger NATO, not a weaker NATO, uh, against Russia. Uh, which I consider to be a foreign adversary. Putin's not our friend. He is an adversary. He's an enemy of the United States. And I think what was disturbing about that press conference with Putin is it almost appeared like they were, uh, like, you know, we're friends mm -hmm. for Russia. We're not. And on the heels of meeting with NATO. And so I, a little bit of mixed messaging there. <clears throat> but I do think the president's surrounded by some smart people. Um, and I do think he wants a stronger NATO, not weaker. That's why he wanted them to pay the 2%. And most presidents previously just given it lip service about, oh, well, you should pay, and, and nothing's done. I think he put some teeth into it, and we saw, I think, $33 billion additional monies pledged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, speaking of the uh, Putin, um, you know, we've had three successive presidents who uh, one president um, – uh, looked into his eyes and saw his soul. Uh, another uh, had Secretary of State that was, you know, pushing reset buttons. 
And now we have a, a current president who seems to, as you suggested, sort of to treat them, treat him as sort of a um, kind of a buddy, if, if not uh, an adversary. So, why why do you think this continues to happen? Why why are we, you know, I mean, the, you know, fool me once, you know, I don't know what the saying would be after the third time. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think he has much of a soul. Yeah. To be honest with you, I I I've been in Russia, uh, in Moscow after the Boston bombing. I was down in Sochi before the Olympics. They didn't want me there. Mm-hmm. I was under intense uh, surveillance, uh, constantly followed by you know the goons with the earpieces, and I had black surveillance cameras in my hotel rooms, the Ritz Carlton in Moscow, with the bedroom, bathroom. And shower. But you, have sure, such, you have such great hair. It must be. <laughs> 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 a little disturbing. <laughs> and it's a state-dominated uh, society. Um, Putin has taken Russia back. You know, Gorbachev. There was a you know under Reagan, Russia I think was moving in the right direction, and a Western security alliance was forming in in Baltic states and Ukraine. He is taking. He you have to understand Putin. I think to understand why he's doing what he's doing. He wants to be a Stalin-esque, czar-like leader to regain the glory of the old Soviet empire and take back what's rightfully Russia's, and that is Ukraine, the breadbasket Mm -hmm. of Russia. That's why he annexed Crimea, the Russian-speaking peoples. He's using the same model in the Baltic states, putting Russian oligarchs in these countries and making it more Russian-speaking and, and controlling the media in those countries, I think his, his ultimate goal is to, is to, again, regain the glory of the old Soviet empire. And, and you know, there's a reason why he's in Syria. A lot of people think it's to stabilize Assad, which it is. Uh, he wants to stabilize a, an ally, that being Assad. Iran's in there now. Uh, the Russians are back in the Middle East it's the first time since 1979 when they invaded Afghanistan under, uh, you know, Jimmy Carter and, and um, the Ayatollah took over and Saudi went dark as well. It was a bad year mm-hmm. for the United States. And now they're back. And why? Because they want to stabilize the side. They also want those ports into the Mediterranean. Those are, and Crimea, the port there too. The ports in Syria are very important to him because it gives him a submarine warfare advantage in the Mediterranean. When I talk to our allies in the Mediterranean, they tell me that now the, the Russians are controlling uh, the Mediterranean. And now for the first time, my wife used to work for Naval Intelligence mm-hmm. tracking Soviet submarines. For the first time since the end of the Cold War, we have now detected them off the coast of the United States. And they bragged about the fact that they were able to do it without us detecting it. Why is that important? Because they deliver the nuclear warheads. No, I mean, for you know, decade plus, we never had to worry about the Mediterranean. Now, now naval forces, um, you know, we have some Aegis uh, destroyer cruisers in Rota, Spain. Now they're supposed to be doing missile defense uh, uh, as their mission, but but they're being distributed now to f- just follow uh, Russian submarines, and so yeah. you know, can't do both things <clears throat> at once. So it, it's a serious complication in the strategic posture. You, you mentioned Ukraine. So, I mean, one argument would be is that um, we really have to, sanctions are okay, but we really have to make uh, Putin pay for what he's done in Ukraine. Um, are we doing enough? Should we be doing more? I mean, what's, the, what's, the, what's the game in Ukraine for the U.S. if we played it properly? Well, uh, you know, we are providing lethal weapons to Ukraine for the first time. Obama's not willing to do that. I think that's important. When I was in Ukraine, <clears throat> I was astounded by uh, there's a kinetic war going on in eastern Ukraine. Uh, they have annexed Crimea, uh, and the cyber warfare that's going on is, is astounding. I mean, it, they're throwing um, everything they have into Ukraine. We're actually learning a lot about Russian cyber capabilities by what they're throwing into Ukraine and the tools that they're using. Um, one example is non-Petua. Now, you want to get in a classified space, where did that come from? We've had a lot of our cyber weapons stolen, mm-hmm. but non-Petua 
a highly destructive uh, cyber weapon uh, the Russians have. They put it into Ukraine, hit a bank in Ukraine, hit Maersk shipping, shut down the port of Los Angeles. L.A. had to go manual because of the cyber, really destructive cyber attack. So they're, they're doing that with Estonia. As you know, they shut down mm -hmm. Estonia way back when, and they're hitting uh, all of Eastern Europe with the cyber uh, attacks. Um, you know, some would say we should annex U U uh, Ukraine into NATO. I think that would be dangerous because it would put us at war automatically with Russia. Uh, <clears throat> but we do have the, the lethal weapons in there to help Ukraine defend itself. As you know, the previous president in Ukraine was very pro-Russian. His campaign manager was a guy by the name of Manafort, which I find ironic. Uh, and uh, <coughs> Didn't get a lot of uh, bang for the buck there. Did <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, <clears throat> you know, I think we have to help Ukraine defend itself. But I think if you look at from Putin's perspective, <clears throat> he, he's very paranoid of NATO, and maybe he should be. And he also views Ukraine as, as a proper, um, the Ukraine is part of Russia, mm -hmm. and Ukraine needs to come back to the mothership. And uh, it, it's traditionally been the breadbasket. That's why uh, they, they, you know, Stalin killed more people in Ukraine than Hitler killed Jews in World War II. Uh, and they killed, you know, they basically worked them to death uh, for the the bread and the food that they made in, in Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, staying on Russia just a bit, um, and this may be a little bit outside uh, your bailiwick, uh, you know, the Polish government is offering to have uh, us station more permanent uh, uh, army brigade there. Um, have any opinion about whether we should go ahead and, you know, sort of have a permanent base in Poland or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah I do. I, I was there... Um, and, you know, they, they've been under, <clears throat> Poland has, has, has gone through, a, you know, a century of occupation, right. whether it be the, not, the Nazis, fascism, communism, um, and I think they are an ally that we need to stand by. Um, you know, one of the most uh, shocking experiences I've had is going to Auschwitz to see the death and destruction, the sheer evil that the Nazis perpetrated. That was, that was my dad's word, by the way. He was a bombardier in a B-17, part of D-Day air campaign, um, and um, that's what they were fighting. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, if you just look historically what Poland's been through, I think the United States needs to stand by Poland and, and uh, yeah. be an ally. Yeah, I have a, <clears throat> a somewhat amusing story. I was visiting the Rotational Armor Brigade that's in Poland uh, a couple months ago, and um, it's a very basic uh, uh, setup that they have, and, and of course the the uh, food that's being supplied is not exactly the top notch. Um, but there was a house being built right outside of where the Americans are stationed, that's big kind of mansion. So I was asking about that, and, and the uh, colonel who's in charge of the brigade told me, oh, that's the guy who's been selling us pizzas every night. So, <laughs> so, these, so the, the Polish economy, if nothing else, would be much better with, uh, at least on the food level, uh, with the pizzas. So let's, on... Again, you know, there's been this routine, you know, regular effort to see if a new relationship with Putin can be possible. But, you know, on the other side of the, uh, of the Eurasian landmass, um, a sort of similar story, which is uh, for, you know, a bipartisan effort for a number of years that engagement with China, uh, particularly economic engagement, would eventually lead to a change in China, that it would reform both internally and externally. Um, I think the consensus is now that that's not going to happen or it's not going to happen anytime soon. You've, talk, you've talked a whole lot about, uh, for example, the ideological battle with the Confucius Institutes. Um, mm. how, how, do, how does China you know, sort of fit into your larger framework for thinking about America's role in the world? Uh, China is a major um, superpower. And they will be our probably largest economic competitor in the next decade. I, by 2025, they they're, they're not they're not. It's just like when Hitler, you know, wrote his Mein Kampf. I mean, they have a plan by 2025 to dominate the world both economically and militarily. How are they going to do this? Um, well, a lot of it they do in the cyberspace. They they steal a, a, a enormous amount of intellectual property from the United States. Huawei. 
ZTE, these companies have infiltrated the United States, stolen our intellectual property. They're not so much as interested in, say, cyber warfare like Russia, Russia. or North Korea or Iran. They're, they're very uh, interested in espionage. They, they stole 20 million, over 20 million security clearances, including mine yeah. and yours, yeah. uh, from the United States government with zero consequence to that. Nothing happened when they did that. Uh, they anthem 80 million healthcare records. They they were constantly involved in the cyber world, stealing things, <clears throat> and they're also very aggressive uh, in Africa and South America. And they go into these countries and leverage them with these sort of like balloon notes or payday loans, I call them, mm. uh, where the countries cannot, at the end of the day, afford to. Uh, pay these loans off. They extract the natural resources. They bring in their own workers, not the local host country's workers, um, and then <clears throat> really exploit them uh, for their own benefit. And this is a, this is a worldwide uh, uh, goal of theirs. Uh, I, and I see them as, uh, uh, you know, they're very aggressive. And they do it uh, in, in, in some ways very under the radar. Uh, but they've been doing it for years. And I think... Uh, yeah, you know, looking on the horizon, they're going to be our largest, both economic and military, uh, superpower we're going to have to deal with. Yeah, I mean, it's a complex problem, obviously, mm -hmm. because there's, it's on the economic level, it's on the diplomatic level, mm -hmm. it's on the military level. So it's a, you know, it's a multifaceted problem. Mm -hmm. um, I was in uh, uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong fairly recently. Um, and what's striking there is the degree to which they feel under the, under pressure. I mean, it's... Uh, it's not what it has been the last several years that's been upped considerably with uh, President Xi uh, being in office. Uh, but, you know, I see Congress is taking more interest in Taiwan. I see less mm. reaction to what's going on in Hong Kong. Mm. Um, is there, are there more steps that we should be taking when it comes to uh, uh, Taiwan and, and, and cross-strait security. I mean, well, you know, I, I, was, I had dinner with the Taiwanese ambassador here in the United States, and he can't even spend the night in his own personal residence. Mm -hmm. And when the, the and we know when the president of Taiwan comes into the United States, they cannot stay here. They have to, they, you know, I think at some point we're going to have to recognize the independence of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the the key, one of the, um, it's it's all a chess game, right? So, mm -hmm. as we're dealing with North Korea. <clears throat> I think uh, China has a real role to play. They, they have a lot of leverage over North Korea. And so, you know, as we look at the strategic diplomatic play here, uh, we need China to help us uh, with North Korea and their nuclear weapons capability. So, um, but uh, I, I think we need to recognize that Taiwan's our biggest competitor now. Yeah. I mean, not Taiwan, China, but China, China yeah. is our biggest competitor. Yeah. Well, speaking of North Korea, so um, if I remember correctly, you, you've said or written that um, you had serious doubt. Well, you, well, the way you put it, the regime requires its nuclear weapons to maintain itself. I mean, the, you know, that without the nuclear weapons, um, you know, it, it would be on its back foot and perhaps in danger of, of, of not uh, continuing to be the, the family staying in power. If that's the case... How do you see the progress or possible progress being made on on the engagement with North Korea and denuclearization? I mean, is this a, is this a circle that can be squared? <clears throat> well, I mean, it, it's um, I mean, you have to look at the history of North Korea in the Kim Dynasty. Um, they have never negotiated in good faith, in my judgment. They have always taken our concessions and never delivered. So with that as a historical backdrop, I have a healthy amount of skepticism mm -hmm. looking at <clears throat> can we get them to a point where they will denuclearize. Um, I think because of, and it's both parties, mm -hmm. right. presidencies right. that have failed, and now they're at the point where they have it. So it, it, you look historically, any country that has the nuclear power, that puts them on the world stage. And it's very difficult to take that away from any uh, nuclear power. Uh, Pakistan, they got it. You know, AQ Khan, the network, you know, proliferated to Iran and to North Korea. Couldn't take it away from Pakistan. Iran is on the cusp 
of, of achieving it, and North Korea is there. I mean, they have it. They have the ICBM capability, and the last step is miniaturizing <clears throat> the nuclear warhead that can be delivered on these ICBMs that we know now can reach the continental United States of America. China, it's not a threat to them because they know North Korea is not going to fire. It's a threat to Japan. It's a threat to South Korea. It's a threat to the United States. And uh, the question is, how can you take that away from them? Um, I think the maximum campaign pressure uh, is possibly the only hope that we have to make that happen. I think sanctions on the Kim family and freezing their bank assets would be a very good move. And I think the one thing that got his attention to sit down at the table was when he saw our warships off the coast of uh, the peninsula and our submarines and realizing that, geez, this Trump guy may be kind of crazy. I don't know what he's going to do. <laughs> yeah. He may actually fire some, some missiles at me. And so I think that was what got us to the table. The positive thing is they, they did release three Americans, prisoners. They have frozen some of their nuclear um, capabilities uh, short term. Um, and they're, they're trying to uh, return POW remains. And that, that's all positive stuff. And I think talking is always a positive thing. But keep in mind that you're dealing with a very deceptive regime that probably has no interest in giving up their mm -hmm. and this is a, probably the most important point when you say denuclearization <clears throat> it means something very different to the north koreans that does to us when we think about it we think about it, that means they're, they're taking away their nuclear weapons and they're going to be off the peninsula when they look at it they're looking at no that means the united states denuclearization to the north korean means the united states is going to pull out of out of the korean peninsula and the United States is going to pull out its nuclear weapons capability. So you're, you're dealing with two very different definitions of denuclearization. Mm -hmm. And they see it very differently from us. What do you think China's actual long-term goal with North Korea is? Is it just to keep, keep the, the tension alive? I mean, or do they actually want, do you think, a solution to the issue? Well, they want a buffer uh, from the United States, mm -hmm. which North Korea provides. They know that North Korea is never going to turn on them. Uh, in a way, they're a bad stepchild to China, I think. But, but they're, you know, our satellite uh, imagery is still indicating that Russia and China are violating the sanctions, and they're still sending oil uh, into North Korea for cash. Mm -hmm. The thing that worries me about North Korea is they're involved in all sorts of criminal activities across the globe. And then if you get into nuclear the potential proliferation, uh, I mean, they're going to be meeting with Assad not too long, you know, sh shortly, yeah. you know, in, in, from Syria. Now, who knows if, if these... Well, uh, they, well, they already provide, they tried to provide already. A, and they did. And, the, and the Israel took out their nuclear capabilities, Assad's in Syria, mm -hmm. but they're meeting with Assad again. They will sell because they're desperate for cash. Their people are starving. Uh, they will sell this nuclear technology uh, for money. It doesn't matter who they're selling it to. It could be Venezuela. It could be Syria. It, it, Iran's looking at this. There is a connection between Iran and, and North Korea and the transfer of technologies and, and, uh, and uh, you know, know-how in terms of how to build a nuclear weapon. So uh, you put this stuff on the black market, and you talk about a homeland security threat, mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that's very disturbing. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the things that came out of the, uh, the Kim-Trump summit was a decision by the president, commander-in-chief, to stand down on the exercises. How long do you think that should go on? <clears throat> or, I mean, you, you earlier suggested there was the pressure that actually helped bring about mm -hmm. you know, the decision to actually meet and talk. Um, yeah. Is, where, where do we, where do we, where's the line where we say, okay, enough's enough when we go back to... Well, Russia? apparently the last meeting with Pompeo I don't think was very successful. Yeah. Um, we made, we made, a, they've made some concessions. We made one in terms of joint military mm -hmm. exercises. But if they're not willing to make concessions, then I think we need, we need to go back to the original plan. That's maximum pressure. Um, I think it's always important to talk, but I also think it's important to look... You know, what's past this prologue, look at the history of this, of this country and the, the Kim dynasty, and are they negotiating in good faith? Mm -hmm. 
Um, one thing I think will get them to the table, and that would be whether Kim Jong Un uh, fears for his own preservation. Yeah. And that would be the military. It's the last option. And Mattis says, you know, I'm doing it to give the diplomats power to negotiate a peace. But uh, um, the non-nuclear proliferation treaty, they, they pulled out of that. You know, this, you know, Bush lifted the sanctions on North Korea. That just put them that much closer to a nuclear bomb. Yeah. And, it, it, and it continues to go on. Well, speaking of non-proliferation, uh, jumping around the globe a little bit, but um, when you were in Europe, uh, uh, how much of the, your conversations had to do with uh, Iran and the decision by the administration to pull, pull out of the agreement? Yeah, and I just met with the E3 ambassadors uh, last week, that being uh, Germany, France, and UK, and um, I was very hopeful that we could have amended the JCPOA to include um, the ICBM capabilities, uh, the inspections at military sites, and the sunset provision. <clears throat> and unfortunately, uh, the sunset provision, I think, was a breaking point. There's still, I know we're still having those negotiations. Mm -hmm. um, I was a critic of Kerry and the JCPOA for a couple reasons. It, it did not stop Iran from being a nuclear power because of the sunset. It, the I told them, so we're going to continue to ramp up our ICBM capability. And there's only one reason why you build intercontinental ballistic missiles. That's to send missiles across continents. Um, and then the inspections, it wasn't anytime, anywhere. And the idea that we couldn't inspect their military sites was a little naive because where else are they going to conduct the research and development to build a nuclear bomb. The $150 billion, I can tell you, has gone into an increase of 40% into their defense and a proliferation of terrorism in Iraq and Syria and Lebanon. When I was in Israel with Netanyahu, he said, my biggest fear is not ISIS anymore. It's, it's Iran, it's this, 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 this foreign adversary on my front door that is now filling the vacuum that we've left in Iraq and Syria, and the missiles, the manufacturing plants in Lebanon with Hezbollah, they actually violated the, the Iron Dome for the first time because they can fire so many rockets, rockets that the Iron Dome can't stop it. And then you look at Gaza, and then you look at Yemen, you know, where the Houthi rebels are fighting you know, the Saudis. It's all Iran inspired. I was talking to an uh, Iraqi vet last night about. Uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq about how all so many of these IEDs came from Iran. In fact, Al-Qaeda was harbored in Iran uh, for quite some time. And, and uh, they are a, a state sponsor of terror. You know, I, I get the good intentions of trying to halt or slow down their nuclear weapons program, but I think there's a, a smarter way to do it. And um, <clears throat> you know, I fear, uh, and they're looking, they're looking at us with North Korea, too. Yeah, to see how we play that. So one of the one of the issues, though, you, you mentioned Iraq, and then of course the Iranians in uh, in Syria and and the land bridge to Lebanon and Hezbollah and Yemen. Um, I mean, what tools should we be using to actually push back against Iran? I mean, um, the administration and and many in Congress obviously are very reluctant to add American troops to the region. Sure. If we don't add more troops to the region, is there a, a, a game to be played, I mean, a way, a path to actually turn back the Iranian uh, mm -hmm. expansion? So, yes, I mean, Netanyahu calls it the Shia Crescent, mm -hmm. is what he, what he calls it. Um, look, it, it's the most complex foreign policy challenge of our lifetime. But biggest humanitarian crisis in our lifetime, unless you lived in World War II, like my dad, uh, with the uh, Jewish refugee mm -hmm. problem. Uh, but the Syrian refugee problem, uh, the, the formation of, of ISIS and, and Al Qaeda in the region. When I talk to our intelligence community, they say there are three goals in uh, Syria. One is to make sure ISIS is never a threat to the homeland. Um, two is to prevent chemical weapons being used in violation of international law by Assad. Number three is political stability in the region. That's the toughest question. 
But think about this. You have Russia in there for the first time since 1979. You've got Turkey, our NATO ally, working with Russia on weapons sales, attacking the Kurds who we fought with to defeat ISIS. Mm -hmm. I will say the collapse of the caliphate, my threat briefings have gone way down since the caliphate has collapsed, and that's good news. But then you got Israel throwing uh, rockets in. you got the Saudis. This thing is hugely complex. And I think the only strategy I see that could possibly, and I, I, I don't always advocate working with the Russians, but they're there. And Assad's going nowhere. He's going to be there. But if we can work with them to get Iran out of the region, uh, that, that could be a positive. Um, but I don't have an easy answer to this one. I, I, again, I think it's the most, I mean, for any of the students out there, if I was going to write a paper on foreign policy, I'd, I'd write about the Syrian, all roads lead to Damascus. And uh, it, it, I've never seen a more complex situation. Yeah, yeah. Again, sorry to jump around a little bit, but I did want to, since it came up last week when uh, uh, the director of national intelligence, Dan Coates, was over at our sister think tank at, at Hudson, he uh, began his, his, his uh, remarks by talking about sort of the, the lights are blinking red again when it comes to cyber uh, security, cyber infrastructure. Yeah. Um, you know, you wear these two hats. You're the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee, but you also sit on the formulations or Foreign Affairs Committee. So uh, first, just the factual part of this is, you know, how, mu how much do you, uh, would you agree with uh, 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 Mr. Coates about the situation? But then I think for this audience and this purpose is um, obviously the, the threat is not so much coming from inside the U.S. It's coming from abroad. What's the, what's the strategy for pushing back against the people that are making this threat? Yeah, that's a great question. I go back to the four foreign adversary powers, that being Russia, China, North Korea, Iran. You know, North Korea shut down Sony Pictures. Iran shut down you know, uh, Aramco, mm -hmm. the, the Saudi's largest oil. China is involved daily on a daily basis on espionage, 20 million security clearances. And, and uh, Russia is uh, involved in a lot of organized crime and potential cyber warfare. And we know that <clears throat> both China and Russia have their fingerprints, as the NSA director Mike Rogers talked about, fingerprints on our SCADA system, our industrial control systems. That means our power. If they have their fingerprints in there, that means they have the ability to turn the switch on and off so they could turn off our power. If you turn the northeast grid off, uh, you're going back to caveman times. It would be highly destructive. You turn off our stock market, for instance. Uh, cyber is has never been taken seriously enough because I think people look at it as some sort of nerdy, kind of geeky thing. But when I look at our offensive capability that we have, it is awesome. We have the capability to shut down governments. We have the capability to conduct uh, major offensive cyber operations that go along with kinetic. We have kinetic you know, forces and then cyber to shut countries down wholesale. <clears throat> but our adversaries have that now too. And Iran has hit our financial institutions pretty hard you know, as well. Uh, and so we, we always have to stay one step ahead of our mm -hmm. enemy. Um, you know, with Homeland Security, I, I passed the legislation to codify DHS as the lead civilian agency to share threat information with the private sector with legal liability protection. Uh, so they, they have the, the, code, the malicious codes mm -hmm. to be able to patch the networks and keep the intrusions out of our private sector. We have, to, we, you know, we have our military that does the offensive, and defensively in the country we have the Department of Homeland Security protecting our critical infrastructures in the, in the nation. So when I, when I get asked about this issue, I mean, and how you deter, let's say, the Russians or the Chinese or wherever, uh, taking advantage of the fact that they have these, you know, these elements already in, inside our, our infrastructure. Um, you know, the old model of deterrence worked a little bit because, you know, after all, we actually had dropped bombs, and so people could see things. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the problems, well, at least when I was in government, was uh, particularly with folks at NSA who had all these marvelous capabilities, they were very reluctant to use those capabilities because if you use them, sometimes you lose them. Mm -hmm. And so it, it always struck me as being a difficult issue, and particularly in cyber, is how you deter without actually sort of showing somebody that the real downsides for you know, screwing with us. Uh, so, yeah, it's a great point. We, we had, you know, mutually assured destruction in the Cold War hmm. with the nuclear weapons. They knew if, if, if they fired a nuclear weapon, we were going to fire one back. And that had a great deterrence. In the cyberspace, we don't have that. So it's kind of like the Wild West. I mean, you're, it's a new frontier where there are no rules of the road, and it's happening all over the globe, and there are no consequences. As I mentioned, the 20 million security clearances, no consequences to that. You know, hitting... If you dropped a digital bomb on Saudi pictures, wouldn't there be a, re a response to that? You shut it down in a cyber attack, and there's no response. So it seems to me that we, whether it's NATO and Article 5, like it, when Estonia was shut mm -hmm. down, wouldn't that have invoked Article 5 under mm -hmm. NATO? It, it didn't at that time. But, but it raises some you know, great legal questions and foreign policy issues about what are the rules of the road when it comes to cyber? And what are the consequences to bad behavior? Mm. You know, I got five kids, and if bad behavior continues and there are no consequences, guess what? It's going to keep continuing. That, and, was, and that the, was my problem with my kids. <laughs> I knew that I had done something wrong. <laughs> so. And so <clears throat> we don't have, uh, we, we tried to define, like I w did the report with CSIS on cyber, and we won at one point in the White House, which unfortunately Bolton took out, but we, uh, wanted to define what is cyber warfare. Mm -hmm. There's no legal definition for what is an act of cyber warfare, what are, is the appropriate response. And then at the same time, you have the intelligence community that uh, is collecting stuff that maybe they don't want to right. hit because the collection outweighs uh, taking a, an office. I'll give you a good example. I, uh, it was after Chattanooga. I was down at, at CENTCOM, and I saw the Internet Cafe in Raqqa where Junaid Hussein, who was the anonymous guy that went to work for ISIS, was starting to radicalize over the Internet. We were worried about foreign fighters, but then also when we saw this, this guy, all of a sudden ISIS had this powerful tool of the Internet to radicalize globally and in the United States. And so I'm sitting there looking at a live feed of this Internet Cafe. And I said, is he in there? And they said, yeah. And I said, well, why aren't we, why aren't we taking it out? I mean, why, why don't we drop a JDAM and just blow up that cafe? Well, sir, we, we're collecting a lot of information out of that cafe right now. Yeah. And we have assets in that cafe. Well, about a month later, Junaid Hussein's walking down the street with his security guys, and he got taken out by an airstrike. Um, and then the Internet phew, went Rock. way down after that. But... But you're right, the intelligence community is always kind of weighing those, mm -hmm. um, you know, those um, attributes. Yeah. If you don't mind, we'll take a few questions yeah. from, from audience, our guests. If you will wait, um, uh, I'll pick uh, folks out, but please wait for a microphone and then identify yourself. And as we always say, um, please try to make it a question and not a statement. <clears throat> so up front here. Uh, Chairman McCall, Sean Lingus with CyberScoop. Um, Senator Rubio said recently that, uh, this is on the supply chain subject with Huawei and ZTE, yeah. that U.S. tech companies are prioritiz prioritizing market access with China over national security concerns uh, that have been expressed by you and others. Uh, do you agree with that assessment? Uh, what more can be done to warn companies of the risk? Uh, I, I mean, they've been informed, <clears throat> but from your perspective, they need to be more more informed, and, and, and what, uh, what ways can you compel them to address the problem? Yeah. So, you know, I, I got the classified briefing on ZTE and Huawei. <clears throat> I don't know why we allow Huawei to operate in the United States. Uh, they, they have no uh, um, practical purpose other than to steal intellectual property. When I was in Silicon Valley, they said nothing, nothing productive comes out of that building. They just steal our R&D. It's very true. And ZTE is an arm of the PRC. 
um, and is infiltrating our uh, networks and stealing our intellectual property. And at some point, <clears throat> we need to uh, recognize that and stand up and, and stop it. And I think in the NDAA, Matt Thornberry and I introduced the amendment to stop the procurement of ZTE products by the federal government and state and locals. That's a good start in the right direction, but I think uh, Ruby is correct. Um, I do have a lot of technology in my district. I have Apple, and they, they will tell you that the phone, that, you know, while some of those components come from China, that they're protected. I worry about supply chain. Uh, anything that's coming out of China, a backdoor into our phones and our networks. You know, I was talking to the Australians, for instance, and they, you know, as China moves towards a 5G network, Australia doesn't have much of a choice but to be under their 5G. And guess what? They're going to they're gonna steal all their data. And so we talked about an idea of like the of 5G for the five eyes, the five intelligence uh, uh, allies that we have. And so um, no, I tend to agree. I, I've been uh, focused a lot on cyber, as you know, with my committee and supply chain. Um, I talk to the tech companies a lot about, you know, if you're sending the parts to China because the labor's cheap and they make them there and send them back, how, how can you assure me that there's not a backdoor in that product? And I asked Apple that very question about the iPhone. How can you assure me, if you're getting parts from China that are in this phone, how can you assure me that, that they don't have vulnerabilities? Now, they'll tell you they're, they're confident that, that it's not there. But I, I, I worry. Yeah, I worry about that. Another question? Don't be bashful. <laughs> I'm front. <laughs> so I'd like to touch on the uh, series. Could you identify Sorry. yourself, please? Uh, ben Rappaport. I'm an intern for the Roosevelt Group. Mm -hmm. So with regards to the Syria issue that you touched on earlier, what I'm wondering is, so you said like the Assad regime, you know, it brutalizes its people and it's being supported by the Russians and the Iranians and it's destabilizing the region. Well, there's a democratic government in the northeast quadrant of Syria, yep. you know, being run by Kurdish, being run pretty effectively by Kurdish fighters and yep. a lot of local fighters in the region. Right. And, you know, they support human rights, gender equality, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> wouldn't the logical thing to, to do in this situation for us to be to throw the full weight of our support behind them and help them gain control of the entire country? Yeah. So yeah, it's a YPG. Um, they are a, a uh, coalition of, of, of many different ethnic pockets that I think could provide a democratic uh, government. Um, and I agree with you. Uh, with that, and, and you know, but then you Turkey now calls them terrorists and they're going to war with them. And these are the very people our Delta forces worked with to defeat ISIS. And it just shows you how complicated it is. And I think inaction is a decision in and of itself, and our decision not to get involved in that region. Um, we have 2,000 operators there. I don't think the American people want more than that, but our ineffective ability to have any foreign policy there for the last six years has created a mess. And so I, I tend to agree with you. They're the most logical group to work with, and we, we worked, fought with them to defeat ISIS. So why wouldn't we use that as a template for governance in Syria? But the problem is since we didn't do anything, and I you know, called on the previous administration to act, um, now you do have Russia in there. Now you do have a stabilized Assad. Now you do have Iran in there. And um, that's what makes it so darn complicated. And I, I, I do think that they would provide probably the best, you know, democracy form of government in Syria. Could, because they do, they do, you know, that group has so many different ethnic, you know, um, components to it. It would, it would make a lot of sense. And maybe long term that's what our strategy should be. But we have to deal with the Russians there. And as long as the Russians are there, Assad's going to be there. And the Russians aren't leaving because they want those ports you know, into the Mediterranean. So I'd love to follow up with you on that. I mean, I think that's a very good point. I just, again, when you get Russia and Iran and Assad there, it's kind of hard to pull that one off. Yeah. So up front here. No. 
Ladies first. <laughs> what is um uh, Mong Dan from Georgetown University? What do you think of the commonality that U.S. and China both can work on? Commonalities at this point. Yeah, I, um, they have this. Uh, they they they're in our academic institutions. This thousand talents program worries me. They steal research and development from the United States. It'd be great if we could partner on, on technology together and have a partnership where uh, the relationship was not stealing our intellectual property in R&D, but rather working together with us on that. I mean, the Chinese are uh, advancing very rapidly on what's called quantum computing. Um, I think the f whoever, whatever superpower gets that first, it'd be like a equivalent of the first digital nuclear bomb. Whoever gets that, whatever country gets that first is going to be a extraordinary superpower. It, it, it will blow computing as we know it out of the water, and it de-encrypts and it does all this stuff. So um, if there are things we could, I think building trust is, is really the key with China. I, I think there's a, a really a, a strong level of distrust right now because of the espionage that we see in the United States and the theft of intellectual property. Um, that uh, in their 2025 goals of world dominance, I think, threatens the United States. Uh, I'd like to see that relationship different. And I think technology is probably one area that, you know, would be great to see us working together for mankind. But I, I think when you look at China as a superpower that wants to dominate and, and steal from the United States, it makes it very difficult. I'm just being honest. <laughs> We've got time for uh, two more questions, so here and then over here. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm Christian Forstner. I'm with the Hans Seidel Foundation, which is the political think tank of the Bavarian uh, Christian Social Union, yeah, CSU. Our party chairman is Germany's Minister of Homeland Security. Mm -hmm. So I come in with two questions. Uh, one, well, I mean, you know, Europe faces a migration crisis. So what is your take on how Europe handles this migration crisis? And the second one, yeah, um, thanks a lot for your comprehensive and very analyt analytical overview of security threats uh, for the US. Where do you see where we do have to step up transatlantic cooperation in addressing um, mutual challenges yeah, in security? So I, I, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I, I think in the United States we we had our 9/11, and we changed our security apparatus. We do, uh, I think, a 9/11 would be very difficult to pull off in the United States today. Uh, Europe, I think, was a little bit behind the curve, and I, I remember going to Paris and Brussels and Germany uh, before the Paris and Brussels attacks, talking about you know information sharing, intelligence sharing with the United States, uh, Interpol, working with the international police, uh, flight manifests coming from Istanbul and other countries into Europe. Uh, remember, you, you know, the pay, uh, passenger name recognition? Finally, Europe has adopted PNR legislation. I applaud you on that. I think I think y'all's 9-11 was probably Paris and Brussels, and I think Europe has started to step up to the plate on securing itself. Um, from these uh, threats on the migration piece, again, that's that's primarily Syria. So you, you know, Jordan has a million of these refugees. Uh, Turkey has 1.5 million, and they're they're also moving into Europe. And I I, I applaud Germany for its compassion. Um, I think some of it may be a social consciousness guilt over. You know what happened in World War Two, to, to sort of remit, you know, as a sort of uh, redemption. Um, but it is becoming a problem for Europe because of the potential for radicalization. You don't know who, who these people are necessarily. You don't have any databases on them. You don't know uh, who they are. And they, and then they, the the thing that disturbed me the most about Europe is is how segregated they are. When I was in France, they were very segregated in their communities, and they can radicalize within these segregated communities, as I saw it in France and, and Germany, um, you know, as well. And I think to assimilate them into their society 
I think in the United States we assimilate uh, the Muslim population uh, more so than what I saw in Europe, where they're not they're more segregated, which is dangerous because then it lead, it could lead to radicalization, you know, from within. And, uh, not to mention, I know politically, you know, culturally. It raises a lot of issues of the European culture itself and, and is this changing our, your culture. So it, it's a great challenge for Europe. I mean, I do applaud the compassion as a Christian, and um, but I also, also recognize the security challenges uh, you know, that it, it brings and, and you face with that. Ultimately, that's why resolving the Syrian crisis is, is it's a root, really the root cause of this humanitarian crisis, and we have to resolve that civil war in Syria. The the Russians did negotiate with the rebel forces uh, to give up their arms, and they would let them live in these villages, and we'll see how long that lasts. Uh, But I think the more we can help NATO and the United States help facilitate uh, political stability and reconciliation within Syria, um, the better off we're all going to be, because at the end of the day, I think Syrians want to live in Syria. It's just a, it's a horrible situation there. I have to toss in a little two cents. I was uh, recently in uh, Germany, and I visited a German language school that was uh, teaching the refugees how to speak German so that they could, you know, integrate and, and take tests and get jobs and the like. Um, so I was in, and they were from Syria, they were from Iraq, they were from uh, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, anyway. The interesting group of people learning how to learn, you know, trying a very sincerely trying to learn German, and the Germans were, were making a big effort to teach them. Um, and then we discovered, and I was with another gentleman, and so we were trying to have a conversation with him. They all speak English. So <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was ironic. You know, they were there learning German, but every one of them spoke you know, really quite good English. Um, so it's, it's a, but it's a difficult issue. Um, we're out of time, um, and uh, so uh, two things. One, housekeeping. Um, if you would stay seated until uh, the congressman is able to get out the door because he has uh, meetings back up on the hill and we don't want to hold him up. Um, but the second thing is, will you join me in, uh, in thanking him for uh, his conversation today, and, which has been great. So thank you, congressman. Thank you. Thanks. Well done.